right, I think we're going to get started, everyone. Please take your seats. Good evening. It is so special, actually, to be sitting up here and seeing so many wonderful faces in the room. Thank you all for being here. My name is Kathy Koo. I'm the Executive Director of Challenge Success. And for those of you who are not as familiar with Challenge Success as maybe others in the room, um, we're an independent nonprofit affiliated with the Stanford Graduate School of Education. And our mission is to partner with schools, families, and communities to embrace a broad definition of success and to implement research-based strategies that promote student well-being and engagement with learning. We have a great program ahead tonight. Um, we have Dr. Wendy Mogul, an expert and a featured guest for us tonight uh, to talk about our program overall with regard to communication, Say What? The Power of Communication for Healthy, Engaged Kids. We also have Dr. Madeline Levine and Dr. Denise Pope, Challenge Success co-founders, to join us on stage tonight. And we also have the special benefit of two high school student speakers to join us up here tonight as well. I'd like to introduce them to you, but first I wanted to just take a moment and say um, a giant thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, we have five uh, entity sponsors tonight. We have Oculus, uh, a Facebook company sponsoring. We have Ajax Health. We have uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation, uh, Sutter Health. We have Sequoia Health Care District, and we have Sequoia Hospital Dignity Health so thank you to all of our sponsors. In addition, we have individual sponsors that are helping to underwrite this event. Um, and we look for sponsors to help keep our ticket prices very low. And all of you who bought a $10 ticket are helping make it affordable um, and as accessible to as many people as possible. A big thank you to our board members, um, our advisory council, to our staff. And again, thank you to everyone for being here. I think. Um, Based on our last ticket count, we have uh, over a thousand guests here tonight. So a real testament to our community uh, for really caring about this issue, about communication, and about all of our kids. So again, thank you. All right, it's it is my pleasure to be able to introduce you to two high school students. Uh, lo that are local here. Um, they are both very active members of the Teen Wellness Committee at Children's Health Council in Palo Alto. Magana Singh is a senior at Henry Gunn High School in Palo Alto. Currently, she is the co-president of Reach Out Care No, otherwise known as ROCK, the longest established mental health club on Gunn's campus and she is also a Sources of Strength peer leader. Renee Remsberg is a senior at Mountain View High School, where she is the president of the Ambassadors Club, which, among other things, strives to educate students and parents and teachers about mental health through school-wide initiatives and student panels. We are grateful to have them with us tonight to share perspectives and insights on the topic of effective communication and on their recent book, Just a Thought. Please join me in a warm welcome for Renee and Magana. <laughs> and Megna. <laughs> I have a right. Thank you, Kathy, for the warm introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Renee Remsberg. And my name is Meghna Singh. Renee and I are here today to talk about a book that we spent the past year producing titled Just a Thought, Uncensored Narratives on Teen Mental Health. We are here on behalf of the Teen Wellness Committee, which is a group of teenagers from all around the Bay Area dedicated to supporting youth mental health. The Teen Wellness Committee is a part of Children's Health Council, a nonprofit organization in Palo Alto that provides mental health care and special education services to youth and families. The book is a compilation of unfiltered, anonymous Bay Area teen responses to a survey the committee sent out last year and is split into four sections. 
to parents, to friends, to educators, and to me. Each section contains quotes, narratives, data, and graphics. Additionally, many members of the Teen Wellness Committee, including Renee and myself, wrote letters explaining our experiences with mental health for each of the respective sections. Here's an example of a page from the two friends section. Youth responded to the question, how do you know if it's okay to reach out when supporting a friend? For each chapter of the book, we have created a comprehensive do's and don'ts list. This page focuses on a do's and don'ts list for parents. These tips were taken directly from youth responses that we received from our survey. The most powerful do's for parents include asking, do you need a therapist? Telling your child that mental health is just as important as physical health. Saying grades won't be written in your gravestone. And one teen said that their parents were open about talking about anything with me with no judgment. The most powerful don'ts or things that you should not say or do as a parent include comments like, you're just asking for attention, saying that everyone goes through this and you'll get over it, if parents avoided talking about it, and saying you don't have time for that. The reason why we created these do's and don'ts lists for each chapter is so that you can see which phrases are most effective and use them to initiate conversation with your kids. We end each chapter by providing examples of how each group that section is dedicated to can support youth mental health. My favorite response on this page is, talk about it. Mental health is just as important as physical health. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We hope this guide raises awareness about how to support our youth, especially if they are struggling with mental health issues. Positive communication skills, such as the examples we provided, are the key to youth and adults understanding each other and connecting individuals to the help they need and deserve. The quotes are honest, the do's and don'ts list are accurate, the letters are powerful, and it's all uncensored. If you are interested in reading Just a Thought, pick up a signed copy at the Children Health Council's table this evening, right by the tickets. We wanted to take a moment to thank all of you for supporting Youth Wellness. And on behalf of the Teen Wellness Committee, Megna and myself, we hope you enjoy Just a Thought. Thank you. Thank you, Renee, and thank you, Megna. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Challenge Success co-founders, Dr. Denise Pope and Dr. Madeline Levine. Dr. Madeline Levine is a national speaker, a clinical psychologist, a consultant, and the best-selling author of The Price of Privilege and Teach Your Children Well. Dr. Denise Pope is a senior lecturer at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University, a national speaker, and the author of Doing School and Overloaded and Underprepared. Please join me in welcome, welcoming them both to the stage. It's the Madeline and Denise show for a little bit. I think those of you who have been here before know. Um, we're going to uh, jump in because we're very excited. This is our 15-year anniversary with parent education. And we want to get a little bit of sense of who's in the room. So we would like you to raise your hand if you are a parent, guardian, or grandparent of a high school student. Just raise your hand. Ooh, that's a lot of high school kids. OK, that's great. Are you a parent, guardian, or grandparent of a middle school student? How about an uh, elementary school student? OK, they have a lot of kids, clearly. Yeah. Uh, preschool. Preschool? OK. How about college? OK. Uh, any students in the audience? Okay, yeah. And uh, how about educators or clinicians? This is a lot, that's good. And please raise your hand if this is your very first Challenge Success event. Whoa, welcome! We are thrilled that you're here. 
So the students that just spoke, Renee and Magna, and you did such a lovely job. I have seen the book. The book is fabulous. I do hope that you go out and, and get it. They demonstrate that young people have a lot to say about communication, right? They are definitely right in it with the adults who are communicating with them. And we need their voices in the mix as we think together about parenting and about education. Uh, they are the first ones experiencing the pressures at school and at home firsthand. And they are often the ones who have some of the very best ideas on how to make changes at school and at home. So I'm thrilled that the CHC got that group of kids together. Um, they really know, because they live through it, the kind of messages they need to hear and want to hear. And it's, I'm thrilled that they're going to join us later tonight, Madeline, myself, and Wendy, Magna and Renee, on a panel. That's what those chairs are for. And we are going to be asking you to do some thinking as well. We're going to be doing some interactive scenarios, which if you haven't been to a Challenge Success event before, it's one of the things that we're known for. So you won't get to fall asleep tonight. You're going to have some, some things to do. Um, raise your hand if you think your kids or kids in your life would relate to what Renee and Megna talked about at the beginning. Yeah. So it's clear for many kids that the pressures of school and home and the message they get from their communities can be distressing. In fact, the whole reason why we're called challenge success is because we challenge our current society's very narrow notion that success is measured by performance, grades, test scores, where you go to college. It's, it's the reason why our, our name, right, that success is flipped backwards on our logo. And we know that real success is much broader and achieved not just at the end of a semester, but over the course of an entire lifetime. So for those of you who don't know us, we have a three-pronged approach to helping schools and families. First, we work with schools to provide research-based strategies for changes in areas like school schedule, bell schedule, homework, advanced placement, course policies, academic integrity, project-based learning, alternative assessments, and uh, most importantly, a climate of care. We want every kid, actually every member of the school community to feel like they belong, to feel like they are part of a larger whole. We also do research. We are here at Stanford School of Education, and we benchmark our progress using school surveys. We find and translate the latest research uh, along with doing our own, and we have a whole bunch of material that's free on our website for schools, for clinicians, and for parents. We'll give you a card on the way out uh, with our website and more information and, and guidelines, and we invite you to explore all the different resources we have there. And of course, we do parent and community education, which is what tonight is all about. So let's get to our theme. Say what, right? The power of communication. So Madeline, I'm going to invite you to tell us what you think is most important um, based on your experience, both as a clinician, as a parent. What's most important for parents to think about when it comes to communication? OK. <laughs> um, I think the single biggest problem in communication is um, the illusion that it's taken place. Uh, <laughs> so I wish I was that clever, but it's actually George Bernard Shaw who said that. Um, but, but I think that's what happens. You know, the, what I hear in my office all the time is my parents don't listen. Um, and I think they're, you know, we're busy, and um, I think it's really hard to always have the bandwidth to communicate as successfully as Wendy suggests we do and teaches us to do in her book. But I think there's a certain kind of conversation, which I call a critical conversation, um, that we should pay particular attention to. Uh, there's a lot of stuff over the course of the day that's easy. You know, can I, can I go out? Can I have a, whatever? That's easy. But then there are conversations that are really tough. And I think those conversations have three things in common. Um, the stakes are high, there's a difference of opinion, and emotions are running high. And when you're in that kind of conversation with your child, it helps to be aware of what's happening both to you and your kid physiologically. And that's that you're not thinking straight, and neither is your child. When you're in a critical, difficult, emotional conversation, your blood is just not going to your brain. It's doing the, you know, fight or flight thing. 
Um, I think there's a way that you can help yourself get back in control in those situations, and that's to ask yourself difficult questions. Um, because we know that asking yourself a difficult question starts pouring blood back into your brain. So I, I'm, I'm going to give an example. Um, when my son was 16, he got his driver's license. So many of you had high school kids. And he got his license, and the next day, I lived in um, Marin at that time, the next day he told me that over the weekend he planned on going to Lake Tahoe uh, with his <laughs> friends. Um, <laughs> which just gives you an idea of the ability to use judgment of a 16-year-old on certain issues. On other issues, they're great. Anyway, so that had the potential to be a really, like, no way, you're not, you know? Like, there was no way he was going in my head. But the therapist in me had a particular thought when he told me that, and that's therapists very rarely say no. Sometimes we say no. But we don't usually, when somebody brings an issue into a psychologist, psychiatrist, any kind of mental health worker's office, we usually say, tell me more about that. And that's what I did with my son, um, and got to hear his thinking, which was, I passed my driver's test, so why can't I go to Tahoe? What's the problem? Um, and we had a conversation about that. How do you know when your child, how do you communicate with your child about what they're ready to do? How do you know when your child's ready to go to Tahoe? How would I know when he's ready? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a whole bunch of intermediary steps between getting your driver's license and being free to take a mountain winding road to Lake Tahoe. And in being able to calm down, not talk for a minute, not get you know, bent out of shape about what he said. It gives me the chance to ask myself this question. What was I so afraid of, right? I'm terrified to have a kid with, you know, six months of driving under his belt, driving up in a, what I think is dangerous. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you say, tell me more about it, as opposed to no, you start to engage in a conversation. If you ask yourself, what am I afraid of? You lower, you lower your physical agitation and you increase your ability to think about it. And out of that, you start thinking about, okay, well, actually, these are the steps that make sense to me. What do you think? First, you have to drive to the next county and then you have to drive two counties over and then you drive across the bridge and then you drive to San Francisco and, you know, in seven months from now, maybe you can go to Tahoe. But you have a bunch of goals and I think when we say no, um, we cut off the possibility of constructing a set of actionable goals that our children and teenagers can then use to meet their own goals. So when you're aware that you're um, agitated about a conversation with your kid, always take a deep breath, always stop back, always ask yourself, what about this particular, whether it's sex or drugs, whatever it's about, what is it that's getting to you? And then listen. Ask for more information. Get more data. It doesn't mean you agree or have to see it the same way. But I was thinking as I was listening to Renee and Magna about how as soon as you say no, it means that there are areas that have been cut off for, from conversation, right? As soon as a parent is like, no, no, there are a whole bunch of other issues that are cut off, like I'm feeling like cutting myself, or I can't get out of bed, or I'm really worried about a friend. And so it, for the sake of just having a reasonable conversation with your kid, I'm saying use no sparingly, but also you want to set up the idea that in this house, in our house, almost everything is a conversation. And you do that by modeling curiosity um, about what your child thinks about something. So that's my idea about, a couple of my ideas about communication, very little. <laughs> she will be back. But we are going to turn over our time to another very famous expert who has a wonderful new book out. Uh, Wendy Mogul is a practicing clinical psychologist. She's a New York Times bestselling author, international public speaker. She's addressed audiences all over the world in more than 500 talks, including, I love this list, businesswoman in Beijing, youth leaders in Sydney, 
Baptist clergy and rabbis, and the graduating class of the Claremont Colleges. She serves on the Scientific Advisory Board of Parents Magazine and is a frequent guest expert on national media, where she weighs in on issues from talking to kids about death to embracing the chaos of messy rooms. And on the topic for which she is best known, the protection and promotion of self-reliance, resilience, accountability, and exuberance. Many of you know her books. If you haven't read them, I suggest you do. She has The Blessing of a Skin Knee. She has The Blessing of a B Minus for old, slightly older kids. You know these books for their wit, their wisdom, their compassion, and their really good common sense. Her new book, Voice Lessons for Parents, What to Say, How to Say It, and When to Listen, offers guidance for communicating with and about children across the expanse of childhood. She actually starts with babies all the way up through adolescence. I think this is her third time with us as a keynote sharing this stage, and each time a huge hit. You're in for a treat. So tonight, back by popular demand, please help me Wendy, welcome Wendy Mogul to the stage. Good evening. So what I've been saying to parents lately is uh, instead of could you tell me more about this is are you out of your mind? <laughs> because there have been some very dramatic things going on in my office. But I first want to tell you a challenge success story. I was speaking at a school and the biggest problem at this school was cheating. And Challenge Success came to the school and did an assessment and encouraged the very brave head of the school to switch their program to a modified block schedule. And after they did that, and this was against great resistance on the part of the parents, because the kids previously, the students had eight classes and they had, the classes met every day, and they had homework in every class every night. After they switched the schedule, the head said to me, they had no more cheating. And I said to him, have you told Denise? And he said, not yet, but that he would. So um, craziness in my office um, first, let me tell you what Jerry Seinfeld says. He says, I am not a great believer in our style of parenting. We're just too into it. When we were kids, our parents didn't give a damn about us. <laughs> they didn't know our names. <laughs> the bedtime ritual for my kids is like this royal coronation jubilee centennial. <laughs> of rinsing and plaque and dental appliances and the stuffed animal semicircle of emotional support. <laughs> and I've got to read eight different moron books. <laughs> then he says, you know what my bedtime story was when I was a kid? Darkness. <laughs> it used to be that if a child was not talking by the time they were two, parents were kind of happy <laughs> because it was quieter. Our parents, but like your dad, your dad right at the top of his head did not at every moment know what grade you were in, right? <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know, uh, Fifth, he didn't care that much and it wasn't because he didn't love you. How many people here use your smartphone as an alarm clock? It's the best alarm clock that's ever been invented in the history of clocks. But if you look, how many people um, look at, when you turn it off, take a little peek? and see what's come in during the night. You have to admit it. <laughs> and sometimes we do this before we even pee, right? <laughs> so 
all of this clutter is in your head. I sometimes think of it as a tsunami of shrapnel. All this stuff is in your head. And I remember when we were happy to get email. Remember that? Email was from someone you knew. And it might be good news. Now it's all this junk that's in your head before you gaze upon the face of your sleeping child. So this is the family formulation now. It's parents plus, here's an, do, do people look at the onion? Do you know the onion.com? How many do? So the onion's great. Anne Lamott, I just read this the other day, she calls laughter carbonated holiness. Isn't that beautiful? Carbonated holiness. You have to look at the onion because it's the only way to get through this stuff. In the past, it would be tune in at nine. You wouldn't even hear about what happened that might be terribly sad or terribly frightening till nine o'clock at night. And now you already know it in the morning. So here's the onion headline. It is, um, where is it? CNN holds morning meeting to decide what viewers should panic about for the rest of the day. <laughs> we displace our fears and our feeling of helplessness onto the one thing we imagine we can change and control. And this is why it's been so bizarre in my office lately. I had three sets of parents say to me, there is so much screaming in our house that I'm afraid the neighbors are going to call the police. And I said, good, I hope they do, because this will wake you up to what has happened in your house. And what has happened is that parents have, are boring down into the children to try to curate their every breath and make sure it's transcript worthy and that they are not stepping outside the lines for one second. So one girl was taking all honors classes, cross country, running cross country every single day after school, twice a week at 6 a.m. and on the weekends. And her mom would sit down and do her homework with her for two hours every night. And as the mother described this, what happened during this homework battle, because I said to the mother, as far as I know, you've already been in ninth grade. Do you enjoy doing this with her? She said, no, I don't enjoy it because when she's doing the math, we got her into honors math. It wasn't easy, but we did it. And when she's doing the math, she writes out the problems and then she erases them and writes them over again. And I said to her, to the mom, you are watching her develop OCD right before your eyes. So the two of them would sit there in the misery of the homework bubble, bound together like parolees with ankle bracelets, and then they would start screaming. And that was the screaming that the mother was afraid the police were going to be called about. So I recommend to Everyone who has not seen it, a remarkable, incredible document. I am so grateful to Challenge Success. There is, as everyone knows, a piece of a cross between pornography and a horror movie called the US News and World Report Rankings <laughs> of Schools and Colleges. So last year, 4.5% of applicants were accepted at Stanford. Next year, it will be minus 4.5%. <laughs> and so what parents do is they start digging for intel to figure out what's causing the stumbling block of the 
B-minus that is going to destroy the child's life. And then once, especially the girls, once the girls are in upper school, they take on the mantle of the anguish themselves. So the mothers are pleading and they say stuff like, but um, a B minus is fine with us. We don't mind at all. Don't worry about it. And then the girls just think, You're, you know nothing. And I'm going to pay no attention to you. The boys do something that labor unions call malicious compliance. Does anybody know what that is? It's what you do. It's when you show up to work, but you don't do anything. <laughs> so they're just in the bathroom jeweling all day at school. <laughs> Parents get frantic. So the Challenge Success White Paper is called, and, and just listen to the double meaning, a fit over rankings, why college engagement matters more than selectivity. We lay the foundation for engagement when we engage with our children. We do not know what 21st century skills are going to be required for jobs. We don't. We don't know if it's going to be robotics or foraging. <laughs> right? Planet. Mandarin, or maybe not so much anymore, up until like two weeks ago, mastery of Mandarin, or welding. But we do know that the art of conversation, the ability to contribute to a conversation, to listen, and to ask pertinent questions is going to be a skill your child very badly needs. So in the tech companies, I'm sure many of you know this, they do six interviews. Probably also in finance and in show business, so everywhere. Six interviews partly to see if this person can talk. <laughs> so we pick the kids up from school and we say dumb stuff to them because we don't know any better. We say, how was your day? She doesn't want to tell you that because she endured that whole day and she did really well. Has anybody seen the Key and Peel sketch comedy video, The Phone Call? Okay, I want you to watch this because, do you know who Key and Peel are? Okay, they're hilarious and wonderful. So humor is such an important way to connect with your inner spirit, to connect with your partner, to connect with your children. So the phone call is about code switching. And your kids, when they go to school, they have to code switch. You speak a certain way to the administrators, another way to the teachers, one way to the super popular group that you'll never be in, but you want to kind of try, and then another way to your best friend. And then it's very tiring. And when they come home, it's the soft landing. They don't want to rehash the whole damn thing again. And what parents are doing is kind of fishing around to see who should be drunk texted that night. Is it the honors chemistry teacher? Is it the friend whose mom didn't invite your daughter to her birthday party? We're doing a lot of mental work. I also had a mom ask her kids, and all of this is good parents gone bad. These are, no, loving, devoted, sincere, serious parents. The ones who need to be here tonight are not here, but your sponsor, because this is like a this is like a 12-step program. It is. It's over parenting anxiety anonymous, anxiety about an unpredictable future. Your sponsor is in this room. So I, I had a mom who has a third grade daughter, and she said to her daughter, Do you like your teacher? That is not a good question. Think about it. Do what what if the girl says no? She still, still has to go there 
every day and be with that teacher. It's demoralizing. This is what Schopenhauer's description of life was. I just found this yesterday. I loved it. Life swings back and forth like a pendulum between pain and boredom. <laughs> it's kind of true. There are sparkling moments. So I'm talking to a mom. She's having a lot of problems with her son only wanting to play Fortnite. And parents have this automatic sort of indignant, haughty, but ignorant reaction to video games. Like, I know it's bad for him. On the other hand, every person in this room, when you were growing up, could like hang out outside with your friends without your parents knowing where you were every single minute. And these kids are locked up in supermax palaces or apartments or houses, and they hang out on the web. So I was talking to this mom. She said, Fortnite, Fortnite, Fortnite's all he's interested in. I said, nothing else? Nothing? And she said, well, the Revolutionary War. <laughs> I said, really? What about it? She said, oh, he knows all about bayonets and muskets. And I said, do you? And she said, no. And I said, this is what's so wonderful about having a child in 2018. You get to find out about Fortnite, and when you have this wonderful, excited little son, you get to find out about bayonets. And I don't care how you feel about guns. You don't have to get all panicky about it. It was the Revolutionary War, and he likes that. We want to be enchanted with their enchantment. And instead of saying to them, how was your day? We can then say to them, oh, here's another example. Um, a this a boy said to his mother, did you know there are 450 kinds of sharks and the biggest is the great white, it's 60 feet long, but sharks only kill one person a year. Dogs kill 200 people a year. And baby bumblebees are called drones. That's where the word comes from, mom. It comes from baby bumblebees. That's why they call them drones. And a parent can say to this child, I never knew that. Tell me more. And then after school, we can say to them, I thought of you today when. And it can be anything they're interested in. But you can say, I thought of you today when I saw a picture at work that was clearly taken by a drone, and I thought to myself, baby bumblebee. And then you have a little private joke between you, which we all really need right now. Another thing that's causing a communication dam is that um, we're all very suspicious of male humans, <laughs> right? Like, uh, uh, Got to teach him about consent, like today, <laughs> right now. So I wrote an article for the New York Times called Who's a Good Boy? And it's about how we speak more nicely to our dogs than to our young sons. We do, right? Oh, look at the face. We love, wonderful. So nice to our dogs. But our sons were a little bit indignant, a little bit contemptuous. It's different with the girls, because the girls are like little attorneys, and they're very sophisticated with language. They speak, they can speak perfectly by the time they're four. They can argue you out of anything. And they know your crazy spots better than any therapist you ever had or ever will have. And they're not afraid of you. It's really scary. So we're afraid of the girls, and we're afraid of what the boys will become one day, maybe. And I, I often say to parents, when we talk about marriage, I say, it's really good to realize that most men 
are somewhere on the spectrum. <laughs> it's true. And most women have a combination of borderline personality disorder, <laughs> bipolar too, with little OCD, which is, a, and both sets, especially in places like this, have narcissistic personality disorder. <laughs> and it's a good combination. It works very well. I am. Um, I want you to get them outside. They're not outside very much. Like only troubled rich kids get to go to the wilderness anymore. <laughs> you know what those schools do. They take them in the middle of the night out of their bed and put them on the plane, take them to Utah, and it works too. <laughs> get them outside, do dangerous things. And I'm not going to repeat this because it's so easy to find, but Ellen Sandsetter, who's a Norwegian professor of early childhood education, wrote a wonderful article called Children's Risky Play from an Evolutionary Perspective, The Antiphobic Effects of Thrilling Experiences. And she said kids have to be at great heights, near fire, near water they can drown in. They need to experience aggression. They need to travel very fast. They need to explore on their own. And when they do that, they can come back and tell you about it instead of telling you how honors chemistry went or how they did on their math test. This is from um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. She says, no, no, the adventure's first. Explanations take such a dreadfully long time. I've interviewed kids all over the country to ask them what I should tell their parents. And they, they say very similar things. One of them said, I said to my mom, oh, I hate it how my friends complain about getting bees. They think their life is over. And she said, why don't you feel like that? <laughs> my mother only thinks about three things, me driving, me choking, and me being abducted. She has an amazing capacity to attach every single thing I do to one of those three things and to spend all of her time worrying about it. My mom is a fun hater, and it isn't true, but no matter how much gender role equality we strive to accomplish, it's still most often the mom who's keeping track of the granular details, like when the pediatrician's appointment is. Um, but one, one of the kids said, I love my mom's laugh. It's like a dying animal. <laughs> but it really makes me laugh as well. And then I love her more. <coughs> Advice to parents from the kids. Reminders are good, nagging is not. If I ask you to check my spelling and maybe my grammar, it doesn't mean I want you to rewrite the paper. <laughs> My room is my temple. There's a difference between pressure and motivation. Please let me make mistakes. Don't act like there are only two positions at any moment, ahead or behind. Please listen instead of thinking up the next thing you're going to say. And that's, there's actually a wonderful 12-step slogan, W-A-I-T, wait, and it stands for why am I talking? And then all the kids everywhere. I was in West Texas. I was in Brooklyn. Oh, same comment. Please tell them to take a chill pill. <laughs> tell them to chillax. Tell them to take a chill pill and chillax. The other thing I tell you to do is to look at the onion. So my editor for voice lessons only let me use three onion headlines in the whole book but no one can stop me tonight. <laughs> Parents seize creative control of third grade art project. <laughs> Parents fighting about who's unhappier. 
daily spin class, only thing keeping mom from driving a car full of kids into the ocean. <laughs> Both iPod earbuds removed out of respect. My, and this one's really profound. It's really deeply subtle and profound. Mom's fears about daughter leaving for college channeled into fight about storage bins. <laughs> and finally, more colleges offering dick around abroad programs. <laughs> it's true, right? Where do they go? Barcelona. They don't even speak Spanish in Barcelona, but it's good. They speak Catalan, but their circadian rhythm is just like the circadian rhythm of young adults. Have dinner, 1 a.m., that's the right time. <laughs> and I leave you with the German poet Rainer Rilke, who said, once the realization is accepted that even between the closest human beings, infinite distances continue, a wonderful living side by side can grow if they succeed in loving the distance between them, which makes it possible for each to see the other whole against the sky. And I add to that, and to have a good conversation. And then finally, a love and spoonful lyric, and I tested this out on the young people who work at my publisher, Scribner, and none of them even knew the love and spoonful, but the lyric is, for the great relief of having you to talk to. We are a social species. We need to talk to each other. Isaiah 8.18, the children that God has given me are for signs and wonders. If you look up from your own phone to catch the signs, they will lead you on an incredible journey to mysterious and majestic lands. I also want them to clear the table even the night before their history test. Thank you very much. Okay, Wendy Mogul, big round of applause. We figured that this night wouldn't be right if we were just speaking at you. And so we decided it was really important to have this panel of kids and, and psychologists and educators and some work on your part to think about how you put some of Wendy's keynote and what Madeline said and what the girls said to use. We don't want you to just kind of have it go in one ear and out the other, so we're gonna put it to some test. So what we're gonna do is some scenarios, and we're going to ask you um, a scenario, you're gonna read it, then you're gonna turn to a partner, talk a little bit about how you might handle it differently, what you might say differently, and then we'll come back together and, and give our thoughts on it. Are you ready for the first scenario? This scenario is called, Just Say No. Your 13-year-old asked to go to a concert in San Francisco, which is about an hour away from where you live, with a group of friends. It is one week before the Wednesday night event. You smile and say, right, like that's going to happen. This is not even open for conversation. They plead with you and say, but Karen's mom already said yes, so did Isaac's and Maria's. You respond by saying that it doesn't matter what other people do and that a concert on a school night is non-negotiable. They say something mean to you, storm to their room, and slam the door. We're trying to make these really realistic, okay? <laughs> so, I want you to turn to a partner, introduce yourself, and in about two to three minutes, talk about what you might have said, how you might have done this differently, and, and how you might handle what just happened with the door slamming. Go. <laughs> 
So I would like to start with Renee and Magna and see how you felt about this scenario. You are older than 13, but how did you feel about this scenario? Yeah, so um, I think the thing that stuck out to me the most was this isn't even open for conversation um, because as kids, we'd at least try to, you know, we, we at least want to try to persuade you or try to argue with you. Um, but like we said during our presentation, uh, one of the most important things when communicating um, with your kids is to make sure that things are open for conversation. Um, and so whether it's going to a concert or talking about mental health, um, it's really important that you facilitate or you open up that space to talk about something, um, regardless of whether or not you initially agree or disagree. I definitely agree, and adding on to Renee's point, I think that when you do have that conversation, and hopefully after tonight you are inspired to not say, like, close for conversation, this is not happening, that's the end all and be all, I hope that you guys will ask for more information like it was mentioned earlier today because that's so important. And also, check your environment, check your surroundings. I think whenever you go into an important conversation, you always want to see how you're feeling. So if you're stressed, if you're hungry and you're cranky, your kid's going to pick up on that and think you're taking it out on them and it's super unfair. So you should always check how you're doing first and see like, are the other siblings around? Are they going to pick up on this fact that you're about to say no? And so just really be aware of like, are you going to have this conversation one-on-one um, -on -one with them? Is it in a space where it's uninterrupted? So you can answer all of their questions or if they're trying to give you more evidence of why they should go and convince you or argue with you like Renee said, are you in a space where you can take that time and have that conversation? And then that's really gonna help so kids are going to feel like you're listening to them and you're at least giving it a chance even if you're really strongly against them going to this concert. Okay, Megna's coming to my house after this. <laughs> I don't know about you. Both of those answers were, were fabulous. Wendy, what, what, talk to us. Well, I, I love the part about not humiliating this young person. And the description says the parents smiled and then it's clearly sarcastic, right? Like that's going to happen. And so that disjuncture between the parents' facial expression and what they're saying is humiliating to a child's desire to go with their friends and listen to music. That's the larger context. So what parents can say is, you know, it might be fine, but I'm not ready for that. I I'm not ready for you to do this on a school night. And then when that student's friends are pressuring them to do something that they don't want to do, they can say, you know, I would have this drink at this party with no adult supervision whatsoever the night before the big game, but my dad would kill me. He's nuts about that. So you are setting, as a parent, setting the stage for them being able to resist peer pressure. Madeline, this is sort of like the Lake Tahoe story, a little bit, right? How do you react? I, I said I'd like to know the band that was playing. Yeah. Um, what kind of concert are they going to? <laughs> so, so my take on it, like, I think because I'm older now and have my first grandchild, and I, I'm like nostalgic for the days when <laughs> you could have conversations like this because it's where you learn about Childish Gambino and Cage the Elephant and 311 and you know, you learn, if you just ask a question like, back to tell me more, um, why is it important? Is it the first time she's been invited to a concert? Is it her favorite group? Is it her boyfriend gonna be there? Uh, you don't, you just don't have enough information to make a call one way or the other and it's how you get into a kid's world is to find out who's, who's playing and who's going and why they want to go. It doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but those are all data points to help you make a reasonable conversation. And also, there's nothing in here that's empathic, like your first concert's a big deal, and, and it's a milestone, and 
there's nothing that says, gee, I'm sorry, or I remember mine, or that must be disappointing, or whatever. All those kinds of things that show you have some empathy with, in spite of your no. Yeah. And a part of me is wondering what this is all about. It goes back to your question of what is your biggest fear, which I thought was brilliant up at the podium, because is it, she says it's a school night. Is the biggest fear missing homework, getting home late, and being tired at school the next day? Is that the fear? Is the fear getting on a train and going to San Francisco and navigating your way to a concert as a 13-year-old? Is the fear um, of, of the parent not being with her for this experience and she's with a bunch of friends and maybe she doesn't know the friends? I actually think the concert kind of matters too. Like, is this a crazy, wild, um, what's that one down, like Coachella kind of thing? Or is this like, um, name a more tamer concert, I don't know, you know. What is it? Yeah, yeah, right? Taylor Swift, I don't know, I just made that up. So I was thinking like, what would a 13-year-old want? So Five-year-olds go to Taylor Swift, okay. So I think you have to kind of really check yourself and say, what's my biggest fear? I think that's a nice strategy, Madeline. And then I would also say this, go back to what Wendy said about taking risks, appropriate risk-taking. You know, know your kid, right? I know 13-year-olds who leave their sweatshirts, you know, every single day in, in the school and, and can't tell me the address when I'm driving them home in carpool. Probably wouldn't send that one to San Francisco by himself. <laughs> But like, I also know 13 year olds who would, who would be absolutely fine. And the other thing that doesn't come up is like, maybe you could go with them, right? Like, I, so this actually happened and one mom volunteered to take the girls on the train and get them to the concert venue and not go in. God forbid they get seen with the mom, but meet them right outside at the end. And it was a lovely thing and it was on a school night. And I, I said, yes. And also, I didn't have to drive my kid to San Francisco. It was like a beautiful thing that this mom agreed to do it. So I said yes. So I, second part of that, though, is she slammed the door. She said something mean, and she slammed the door and went to her room. So how do we handle that? <laughs> We're looking at the girls. <laughs> um, I think something that's really important is giving both you and your child time just, just let them take a breath, let them slam their door, let them text all their friends and be like, oh my God, my parents said this, oh my God, this is the end of the world. Give them that time and then once both of you, had, you have taken, um, oh, taken a pause, taken a breath, maybe this is after dinner or maybe this is an hour later once they're distracted and doing their homework or something like that, that's when you revisit this conversation and you, you have the chance to explain yourself and hopefully you can realize, okay, maybe my tone wasn't the best, or these are my concerns, and you can start to have that conversation when both of you are in a better headspace. And I know, Wendy, you talked about rules of civility. Do you wanna um, give us the highlights of that? Um, the, the most recent research study, the most unhappy demographic of parents are mothers of 15-year-old girls. <laughs> so, the, the, and it's But there's very, still hope, there's still hope, right? Yeah, it gets much better, <laughs> but it's so good to know it's not personal. This mother said something mean to her daughter. She was sarcastic and smiled as she said it. The other piece of the context is that adolescence is a period of the greatest agony and anguish and the greatest ecstasy of all of life. At the same time, they don't have a long view because they haven't been around that long and their prefrontal cortex is not developed yet. So parents have mature judgment and teenagers have passionate desire, and I think everybody mentioned being respectful of how badly she wants to do this and how excited she is, and talking to her about possible other opportunities or finding a mom to drive, I love that. All right, we are ready for scenario number two. Dun, 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 dun. Yep, we're going there. We're doing media overload. 
Your child, not age specific on this one, your child is constantly on their smartphone. They are on it in their bedroom. They have it on while they are doing homework and they seem to play with it during every free moment. It is a struggle to get them to put it away at meals or to even come to meals or even to have a conversation without a device-related distraction. You feel like you are the phone police, asking them to put it down all the time. One morning at breakfast, your child keeps ignoring your questions and instructions about the day ahead, all while looking at their phone. You snap and say, I've had it. Put your phone down and look at me. You are totally addicted to that thing and it's driving me crazy. Your child rolls their eyes, grabs their backpack, and heads for the door. So I want you to think about what you would say, how you would handle it differently, and also how you set boundaries around media and phone use with whatever age child you have. You can turn to a new partner, you can turn to the same partner. We're gonna come back together in three minutes, go. <laughs> Madeline, talk to us about media overload and how you would handle this situation. I'm, I'm still so impressed that everybody stops when you get to one. I know. <laughs> I, so you cool. and me both. <laughs> um, this conversation is overdue. Uh, <laughs> it, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you get to the point in your family where your child is so completely disengaged from conversation so that they, you know, this can't be a very young child, so it's been going on for a long time. Um, it's, it's a long, complex conversation that is not going to take place when you're angry. Um, it, you know, I was just talking uh, to the kids at Millennium who, uh, that Millennium is a school started by um, Jeff Snipes who had been on our board. It's a very, very innovative, interesting school. And one of the things they did was have the kids themselves do all the research on media and they and develop a set of guidelines and the compliance is amazing. So this is a discussion that needs to take place um, with the kids' input, with boundaries, and every time I have something like this in the office, there's always an issue with the parent. Like I don't see a kid who does this who hasn't learned how to do it well from a parent, right? So it's, I once had this, um, Mom come in, similar kind of story, and she came in with her daughter who she brought in because she said her daughter was very materialistic. And she leaves the daughter and the mom goes out and the daughter gets right up, goes to the computer and picks, um, somehow knows how to do this and gets to mom's bag buying history on her mez. And it's like, $120,000 worth of Hermes bags, and, and, and she said to me, you've got the wrong person in the office. <laughs> and, and she was right. So I'd probably be talking to the parent about their own usage in addition to their kid's usage. Yeah. Common Sense Media studied the first major study of adults' tech use. 1,700 parents of children ages 8 to 18, the parents averaged more than nine hours a day engaged in screen-based media. And one of the things that's so tricky for parents is that we live in a global economy and with different time zones, and we're sort of like emergency room physicians always on call. And what parents can say to the kids is, oh, when I'm doing it, it's work. When they're doing it, it's also work because play and socializing and games and connecting with their friends is their work. So this is at breakfast, and I was struck by the words that um, the parents said, the child keeps ignoring your questions and instructions about the day ahead and looking at their phone. That's not necessarily a pleasant conversation for the child. So if you take home anything I've said here tonight, the one thing I want to remind everyone who escorts their child to school is to get them there early or on time without rushing. Kids love predictability. They love 
consistency, especially during transitions. So the morning is a very sensitive time, and I just pictured the parent bar barraging this child with instructions and questions, and the child is just shielding herself. Do we know if it's a boy or a girl? No, we purposely didn't say so that people could relate. I know it's a girl. <laughs> oh. Because it's different with the boys. They certainly spend a tremendous amount of screen time in their room with the door closed, playing games and doing other things that they are, once they enter adolescence, protecting their parents from being exposed to in a very respectful way. Thank goodness they do that. But um, this sounds to me like a mother and a daughter, and she's just, the daughter has figured out a way to make a little bit of a barrier from the anxiety and the intrusion that she may experience with all these questions and plans. So, oh, somebody really liked that. Okay, so. <laughs> On time or early. <laughs> Renee, what, are there rules around media that you think would be appropriate for kids like this? Um, none that I can think of specifically, but obviously setting boundaries is entirely reasonable. Um, if you are going to do it, though, uh, it has to be a conversation between the entire family. Um, so if you and maybe one of your children talk about it, but the other child doesn't do it, or um, the other parent in the household doesn't do it, um, it's not going to be very effective. Um, and if you're making the rules yourself, uh, it probably also won't be very effective. Um, so it needs to be something that everyone kind of talks about together, and it needs to be something that not only applies to the child, but also applies to you. Um, so kind of echoing what has been said, um, just making sure that parents are checking themselves and making sure that they're also following the boundaries that the household has set. So if you have a no phone at the table rule, that goes for everyone in the family. And I think the consistency is key, and I think you can set certain boundaries. No phones in the bedroom might be appropriate for everyone. It's okay to say we are the adults and we are going to have phones in our bedroom and that's where the common charging station is going to be, but you are not going to have phones in your bedroom. So it doesn't have to be totally equal. But I do think if it's a family meal, then it should be a family meal. And I, I'm also watching what this is doing to marriages, the phone in the bedroom, because the unusual thing about a phone compared to a book or a magazine or television is you can't tell what the other person is looking at, so you can't share it with them. And I've had many patients say to me, I feel like she's having an affair, or I feel like he's having an affair, because, simply because they're in bed together that time of day when you sort of decompress and make fun of the kids, maybe, <laughs> instead of being sarcastic <laughs> at them. And one person, maybe it's very important, maybe it's work, maybe it's just surfing. You don't know, but that phone is in the bed too. Yeah. So I would like to have no phones at the dinner table, at the food, when at family meals, or in the bedroom. Think about the rules it's that radical. you might do. Yeah. Yeah, think about the rules that you made. I do want to say this, I, and it is something that you said in your book, Wendy, that the phone is the connector for the kids. It is like going down to the mall like we used to do. It is like being on the phone when we had to have call waiting because we were on the phone so much growing up. I mean, I think phones bring kids together, and they can be a wonderful form for creativity and connection. So you don't want, you know... It, and at what age do you get a phone? We don't have time for, for this conversation, but there are all sorts of resources. Common Sense Media is a great one. Wendy's book is a great one. Um, so I want you to really think about if you don't have rules, you should start thinking about them, even with a preschooler. And if this is going on in your house, what is really behind everybody's actions at this particular juncture? And one of the things the kids do, because they're so savvy is the now eight-year-olds, sometimes seven-year-olds will say, besides all my friends have a phone, they say, mom, don't you want me to have a phone in case of an emergency? Yeah. Yeah. And the reality is all their friends will have a phone if there's an emergency, but the parents buckle right away as soon as they hear that word emergency. Okay. 
We, you should just say, Tomorrow. ask one of your friends. Ask one of your friends to yeah. call me. That, that'll, that would be just fine. OK, we are moving on to the third one because I want to make sure we cover this one. What about college? It is getting toward the end of the semester, and you check your child's online grade homework portal and are surprised to find that they have dropped more than a full letter grade in one of their core subjects. You know that junior year grades are really important for college, and your child, who's a junior, has mentioned that they want to get into your alma mater, a school that's really hard to get into these days. You are upset that your child never mentioned the slipping grade and does not seem to realize how this might impact their college applications and their future choices. What do you say? What do you think are the actual implications? We're going to do this for two minutes and come on back. Go. <laughs> Magna. You are older than a junior, but you probably remember this from last year. What, talk, talk to us. How would you respond to this? So the thing that stands out to me when I first read this scenario was a drop in a letter grade. So as a mental health advocate, I feel like it's my duty to say this because I, this is something that I look out for in my friends. If their grades are dropping drastically and it's very unlike them for that to happen, like red flags go off in my brain that a conversation needs to be had. Put aside the college, put aside the grade, put aside GPA for just a moment and check in on them. And I think that's the message that I would tell all of you. If you check their grades or if you ask them what their grade was and it's different than what it normally is, um, I think that constitutes a discussion. And I hope that all of you now know that this is really important and that they may not even know that their grade dropped. Something bad may have happened that day which made them um, get a lower grade on a test or maybe they don't care about what grade they got. But whether it's any of those answers or something completely different, a conversation needs to be had between you and that child to see how can you best support them and if there's other issues going on as well. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's what I'd have to say. Yeah, building off that, um, and it's important to approach this in a very open manner. Um, so not in a like, here's something you're doing wrong, or like, what's going on, but more in a, hey, you know, I noticed this when I checked this. Uh, how do you feel about this? Um, is there, was there a test? Is something else going on? Um, just generally talking about maybe the bigger picture like Megan was talking about. Um, you know, how have things been going lately? It's really important to have this as an open conversation and not go in with a very narrow lens of um, it's just the greater, it's just college. Wendy's writing stuff down, so Madeline, I'm going to turn to you. <laughs> okay. Um, it, so I, I very much appreciate your pointing out that dropping grades can be a sign of depression or anxiety, or, but more likely to be depression. Um, but in, in, first of all, I want to know if mom and this kid have agreed to mom's looking at his grades online. I, I think I've mentioned before, I had to cut that out when my kids were growing up because looking at online grades is um, intermittent reinforcement, the most powerful reinforcement there is. Uh, so when your kid does well, you get a hit of dopamine. Um, and when they don't, uh, you're missing that hit of dopamine, so you go back, keep going back. I hate this stuff. Um, think about if you were being looked at every minute of the day and somebody was evaluating you every minute of the day, whether you did your homework, whether you got a grade, whether, uh, you know, it's, to me it's crazy, sorry. Um, so if you're going to be looking at it, Make sure your kid knows that, that there's some agreement about how you're going to use that information um, so that it's not uh, a surprise, like, what the hell were you doing looking at my grades? Um, and then I, th I think, you know, it's from an A to a B minus, who knows? It, the kid's in high school. Um, it may matter. It may not matter at all. It may make a difference in the college that accepts him. And it may make absolutely no difference in it. The, the, I think implied in this is that it's going to be a problem for college admission. 
And because it's, there's that thing about it's hard to get into your college. I just asked um, Wendy where she went to college. And she said she went to Middlebury and would never get in now. And um, I know you went to Harvard. And I went to the State University. I just, I, it, it's the um, blessing of getting older to be able to say this stuff doesn't matter in the way you worry about, you think about, you obsess about. It just doesn't make that much difference as the fantastic white paper that Challenge Success, headed by, head by Denise, really put out. So from my point of view, you asked a simple question. I noticed your grade drop. Anything you want to talk about, you know, or how come, or do you care? Or, but it's over the course of uh, your relationship with your kid and their life, it's likely to be incidental. And I, I agree very much with that, Madeline. And we have TMI. Uh, teachers are going out of their minds over at these web portals where parents can see the grades because they say before the ink is dry on a quiz, they're hearing from parents, and sometimes it's before the student even knows. And one mother said to me, she said, I'm so addicted, I'm so addicted. She said, I keep clicking refresh because I can see my son's national cross-country varsity ranking, and as Madeline says, I get a hit of dopamine. There's a, another site called bunkone.com, and another general principle is please send your children to sleepaway camp. Make sure you do this because, and then make sure that they get the opportunity to be counselors at sleepaway camp because one of their campers is for sure going to throw up. And this is the best preparation for college where there's a lot of throwing up. Much more important to have a job, earn money, clean up the vomit than one B minus. But the parents look at bunkone.com, which is photographs of kids at camp, and they will call the camp directors and say, I, I saw a picture of Madeline, and you know she was standing a little bit by herself with a bunch of other girls who were all laughing and seemed to be joking together. And I was wondering if she's really as happy as you're telling us she is. We just read too much into too much information. Uh, yeah, we talk to schools about this a lot. A lot of our challenge success schools have the issue of what to do with the online portal and the parent addiction or even the student addiction. And we talk to them about maybe you want to purchase a portal that you have the ability to turn on and off. We have portals that you can actually kick someone off if they've checked it too often and you can <laughs> set what that is. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. <laughs> And so you a parent, can, you can, you can kick, kick a, a parent off, you can kick a student off. If they check it, like so you set it at a certain amount of time, it's great, it's great. Um, and I think that's this, the best paradox of everything. Yeah, right? right? Like checking it too often. That you're checking too often. So, yeah. the, you know, the, it was made to give parents a heads up that their kids weren't doing well. And it was made to give the kids the ability to see that and to kind of change their ways. And it's like, it went, it went south, right? It, it, something that was designed to be a good thing became something that is actually causing problems. Um, so I think, yes, too much information. I, the people who have find your phone, you know, I have a friend who has a kid in college who was like, let's see if he went to classes today with find your phone. I was like, oh my gosh, what if he's at his girlfriend's, what, you know, like, what if he's at a bar? What, this is crazy. He's in college. This is when you're supposed to get away from your parents. So I think really thinking about how often you check in and check in and monitor. But I think that the other piece that, that, that both girls mentioned is you got to talk about this because college is one of those things that, that is this looming fear. Um, the kids feel it, the parents feel it, the, the, the teachers at the schools feel it. It's why we wrote the white paper, which is free and downloadable on our website. And it wasn't just me writing, it was an, our an incredible research team. And it's so um, good. the message is basically, we, this is what happened. We were getting kids who were saying the number one stressor it, that we're facing in high school is the load. 
and the number two stressor is fear about college admissions. And we were saying to schools, you've got to change your schedule like we did with the school that Wendy was talking about, and you've got to make some policy changes. And what we found out is they were afraid that if they did those changes that we know are really healthy for kids, that it would affect their kids getting into college. And so we figured if we wrote this paper that looked at the research around if it matters or not, where you go, that this would be a huge relief to kids and parents, but also a relief to schools that said they will make changes. So uh, the, one of the main findings, aside from it doesn't matter where you go, which really I want you to read the paper or even just the executive summary, is that it's, it's much more about fit and what you do in college matters much more than where you go. And so this scenario, it's not so much about the grade that fell, it's what is that kid doing in school? Are they okay? Was this just one of those slips and like, you know, the new grade hasn't been updated yet, which often happens, or is this gonna be something that is a pattern that something's going on and, and he or she is disengaging from school? We work really hard to keep kids healthy and engaged in school. It turns out that's what's actually best for them in college and in the long run as well. So it's okay to be worried about this, but I wanna make sure you're worried about it for the right reason and not just because you want them to get into your alma mater, which quite frankly for many of us is very, very hard to get into these days. And it's okay because it's the kid, not the school. We're not giving ourselves enough credit as to the fact that we could have gone to all different sorts of schools and you two can go to many, many schools. There's 4,500 accredited universities in the United States. You can't even name 50, right? So if you think about it, even if you just said, I want my kid to go to the top 5%, right? That's, that's, what is that? 5% of 4,500. You do the math. But we know, we know that even kids who end up deciding they don't want to go to college for a little bit and taking a gap year or getting a job or taking classes at a community college and really figuring out why they want to go might be the absolute path for your kids. So there's a lot wrapped into this question um, that hits really, uh, hits home. And I want to just make sure you're, you're recognizing the messages you're sending from the minute you say, how'd you do on the history test, to I'm checking your grades, to I'm going to wear the sweatshirt of my alma mater, to oh, let's go visit my alma mater. There's a lot of pressure building on the kids. I just, yeah. just want to add to that, that a lot of that pressure is um, covert. And so plenty of parents will say, boy, I never do anything to tell my kids that they have to go this place or that place. But their dinner time conversation is about the kid down the block who got into Juilliard or Yale or whatever it is. So um, kids will often say, my parents don't say anything, but it's absolutely clear uh, by what they read, by what they talk about, what they value. So, you know, what's your subtle messages? Well, this is why well. you need to read Wendy's book because the voice lessons are about not just what you say, but how you say it. And as the, uh, both Renee and Magna said, and the situation around it and what else is going on and who else is listening. So we hope tonight that we gave you some, some nice chances to practice what you may or may not face when you get out of here. Um, but we do appreciate you taking the time to come and pay attention to this very important uh, idea of how to communicate and really how to listen. So we thank you for listening and for your participation. We are actually going to send a follow-up email with a link to a very short survey about your experience. We'd love for you to take it. We do look at that information and change up our programs um, to, to make sure we're keeping people happy. Um, we'll ask you to reflect on some takeaways from tonight as well. I do want to shout out once again to the sponsors and guests who made tonight possible. We appreciate your support. As a nonprofit, all of your gifts at whatever level matter. I want to say uh, uh, that if you're inspired to support this work to reach even more families and schools, we'd love for you to pick up a text to donate card or visit our website to give. We want to thank Paige Parsons for the photography and Andrew Mellows. I have to give a shout out to Andrew Mellows, who has been taping the Challenge Success Friday evening parent ed for years and years and years and years. This is not only the last one that he's doing, but this is his final act as a videographer. He is retiring tomorrow. So big round of applause for Andrew. We love you. 
all of the books, including the books that the, the students wrote, which were fabulous, um, all books are, on, uh, are available in the lobby. We will all be there to sign. And I um, will leave you on this note that I want you to go home and either have a great conversation with your older kid tonight or your younger kid who might be sleeping, you can have a conversation tomorrow where you tell them how much you love them and really take the time to listen when they respond. Thank you so much. Have a great, great evening.